G'day, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the third season of the History in the Bible podcast. In this final season, I explore how the Jews and the Christians constructed new religions when they were sent spinning into the void after the destruction of the temple. All of the history about all of the books beyond the Bible. Episode 3.18 Christians under the Roman gaze In previous episodes, I related the history of the final two revolts of the Judeans, the Kittos War and the Bar Kosiva Revolt. I also had a stab at exploring the origins of the rabbis and introduced the new survival manual the Jews develop, the Mishnah. As I discussed in those shows, our sources about Jewish history of the time are so meagre that there is not much more to say. Most of the rest of this season will explore the history of the Christians to the year 200. In this episode, I investigate the state of the Christians in the early 2nd century, when Jesus' disciples were long gone. The successors of the Jerusalem Jesus Club seem to have been a community the church fathers called the Nazareans. They had their own book, the Gospel of the Hebrews. The Gospel according to the Hebrews was probably written around the same time as our later three Gospels. Call it the year 100. The Gospel according to the Hebrews may be the same as another book called the Gospel of the Nazareans. For many decades, the Gospel was a contender to join the New Testament canon. According to the Church Fathers, Hebrews was very similar to our own Gospels. It is just a little shorter than the Gospel of Matthew, which would make it a fairly mighty work. Writing around the year 400, long after Christianity had been legalised, the Church Father Jerome thought that the Gospel of the Hebrews was the Hebrew or Aramaic original of the Gospel of Matthew. By Jerome's time, the Gospel of the Hebrews was already fading from view. Few modern scholars believe that the Gospel of Matthew was translated from another language. Matthew's Greek just does not read as a translation from another language. And consider this passage. According to Jerome, the Gospel of the Hebrews says this, Quote, After the Lord had risen, he went to James and appeared to him, for James had sworn that he would not eat bread from the hour when he had drunk the Lord's cup, until he should see him risen again from among those that sleep. The Lord said, Bring a table and bread. He took bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave it to James the just, and said to him, My brother, eat your bread, for the Son of Man is risen from among those that sleep. End quote. James the just, the brother of Jesus, does not appear in any of our four Gospels. The Gospel of the Hebrews rectifies that omission by establishing a bond between James and Jesus. Just as Jesus had sworn not to drink of the fruit of the vine until he drank it in the new kingdom, so James takes a similar oath. The church father Eusebius discovered that all the bishops of Jerusalem had Jewish names until the Bar Kosovo revolt in 132. Thereafter, all the bishops had Greek names. It would seem that the third and final revolt of the Judeans extinguished the Nazarene Jewish club of James and Peter. For more on that, settle back of a pie floater and rewind to episode 3.8, Earliest Christians 1, Peter against Paul. There was another community of Jews for Jesus fans, the Joannines. This community wrote the gospel and letters attributed to John the beloved disciple. To refresh yourself about them, take your ferret for a stroll 
and regale yourself with my episode 2.30, John's Gospel of Knowledge. The Nazareans were always regarded as a separate but respected community of Christians. The Joannine clubs were rapidly absorbed into the Gentile Christian body politic and lost their identity. Their Jewish origins were either forgotten, ignored, or suppressed. As the Nazareans and the Joannine communities faded into history, a new group of Judean Judas fans entered the historical stage, the Ebionites. They suddenly appeared after the Bar Kosiva revolt in mid-2nd century, for reasons we do not understand. The Church Fathers, when they had anything at all to say about the Nazarene, wrote nothing but praise. They applauded their orthodoxy and acclaimed the apostolic succession of their bishops from James the Just until the Bar Kosovo Revolt. These same fathers were quite vicious about the Ebionites. They denied that the Ebionites had anything to do with the Jerusalem Club. The Ebionites might have been a cohesive community, or just a name the church fathers used to label the object of their scorn. The origin of the Ebionites is a mystery. Some say the Ebionites were founded by one Ebion, a person unknown to history. Others that their name was from the Hebrew Ebion, poor or needy. In the Old Testament, that word is used in a positive sense. We only know about the Ebionites from their bitter opponents. These were the same ancients who misled us about the Gnostics they also hated, a deception only revealed after we found a treasure trove of Gnostic documents in the early 20th century. If the Church Fathers misunderstood Gnostics, they must surely have misinterpreted the Ebionites. Still, we only have the sources that we have. Bishop Epiphanius quotes a few hundred words from the Gospel of the Ebionites. Only Epiphanius had quoted more. The Gospel of the Ebionites might have been a harmony of our Synoptic Gospels, with a strong preference for Matthew, that most Jewish of Gospels. We can't be sure. We do know that they discarded Matthew's first two chapters about Jesus' virgin birth and genealogy. The Ebionites held that their views were those of Peter and James. According to Epiphanius, they believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people in fulfilment of Jewish scriptures. Now, this did not endear them to most Christians who believed that Jesus was sent to the whole world, a world that was not required to follow the Jewish law. To the Abionites, Jesus was the most righteous man who ever lived. He kept the law perfectly. But he was just that, a man. He was not born of a virgin or born the Son of God. Because of his unmatched righteousness, God bestowed a unique blessing on him, a benediction granted to no other man, before or since. God adopted Jesus as his son at the moment that John baptised him. God then sent Jesus on a great commission, a command to change the world. Jesus was sent to sacrifice himself for the sake of others. Jesus went to the cross as a punishment for the sins of the world, perfect sacrifice, in fulfilment of God's promises to his people. God then raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to heaven. The Ebionites were adamant that they must emulate Jesus and assiduously follow the Jewish law. Their hero was James, brother of Jesus. They despised the apostate Paul, who preached that adherence to the law was irrelevant. Paul, they said, was just some Greek who only converted to Judaism in lust for a daughter of the high priest. Paul was beneath contempt. The Ebionites withered after only two generations. Christians writing around the year 200 barely mention them. Later church fathers recorded a few remnant communities and... That was that. 
by the time the Christianity was legalized a century later, all the Jews for Jesus clubs, in their many variants, were well and truly gone. How did the Roman state regard the Jesus clubs in the years after the three Jewish revolts? Until well after the Great Revolt of 66, the clubs were virtually invisible to the Roman state and populace. Just another oddball sect of those wacky Jews. In the year 98, the Emperor Nerva accidentally defined Jews as those monotheists with privileges exempting them from some state obligations, but bound to pay the tax called the Fiscus Judaicus. The Christians then became those monotheists, free of the tax, but with no exemptions from state responsibilities. Nerva knew the Jews well enough, but he had only the vaguest idea about those other guys. To hear more about that, pack yourself a pipe of your favourite herbal mixture and fall asleep to my episode 3.7, Reconstructing Judaism. Over the next decade, those other guys, found themselves increasingly under the Roman gaze. Our earliest evidence is from the governor of Bithynia and Pontus, the urbane intellectual Gaius Plinius Secundus. We know him as Pliny the Younger. I introduced Pliny as a friend to the historians Tacitus and Suetonius in episode 3.4, For the Great Revolt, Part 2, The Christians. Pliny wrote compulsively to his friends and to the Emperor Trajan. His hundreds of surviving letters are a wonderful window into a life lived at the highest levels of Roman government in the Golden Age of Empire. In the year 110, Governor Pliny had a problem. The Roman world had no police force or investigating magistrates. The Romans relied on private citizens to bring forward complaints of criminal behaviour. Certain citizens complained to Pliny that some people calling themselves Christians were actually criminals. The informers demanded justice. Pliny was perplexed. He wrote to Emperor Trajan for advice. Quote, I have never participated in trials of Christians. I do not know what offences It is the practice to punish or investigate, and to what extent. And I have been a not little hesitant as to whether pardon is to be granted for repentance, or if a man has once been a Christian, it does him no good to have ceased to be one, whether the name itself, even without offences, or only the offences associated with the name are to be punished. End quote. This letter is a cornucopia of information. Pliny has heard of the Christians, but knows little about them. He recognises they are not Jews. But he is confused as to why his informants want him to prosecute them. What crime have they committed? Back to Pliny. Long quote. I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that, whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserved to be punished. Amongst these, I considered that I should dismiss any who deny that they were Christians, when they had repeated to me an invocation to the gods, and had made offerings to your statue, none of which things I understand any genuine Christian can be induced to do. The accused asserted that the sum of their fault had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day, before dawn, and sing a hymn to Christ as to a god and to bind themselves by oath, not to commit some crime, and not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, nor falsify their trust. When this was over, it was their custom to depart, 
and to assemble again to partake of food, but ordinary and innocent food. Even this they affirm, they had ceased to do after my edict by which I had forbidden political associations. Accordingly, I judged it all the more necessary to find out what the truth was by torturing two female slaves, who were called deaconesses. But I discovered nothing else but depraved excessive superstition. End quote. The Christian defendants assert they are jolly good chaps. Yet Pliny is troubled. These Christians hold meetings before dawn, in secret. The Romans were very wary of organisations that met in private, let alone assembling at night. A century before, the Emperor Tiberius banned fire departments because he feared that these would be places where the plebs could assemble to plot against the state. The Jews had special waivers to attend synagogues. Pliny's interrogations, which include unpleasant rounds of torture, reveal nothing criminal. But what he does here leaves a bad taste in his mouth. Depraved, excessive superstition. Pliny is anxious about the possible spread of this superstition. He also objects to their obstinacy, a trait he regards as worthy of death. This charge will be levelled against Christians for generations. Notice that Pliny tests the accused by asking them to supplicate to the emperor's statue, which no Christian can do. Pliny may not know much about this odd new superstition, but he does know that the Christians are strange into refusing to acknowledge the variety in the divine realm. Save for the Jews, all the other peoples in the empire had favourite gods, but accepted other divine beings. You could be utterly devoted to Artemis, but of course you would sacrifice to Bonadia if you were hoping for a child. Makes perfect sense. Pliny concludes by asking Trajan for advice. Quote, I therefore postponed the investigation and hastened to consult you. For many persons of every age, every rank, and also of both sexes are and will be endangered. For the contagion of this superstition has spread not only to the cities, but also to the villages and farms. But it seems possible to check and cure it. End quote. Trajan replies with a great deal of common sense. Quote, you observed proper procedure, my dear Pliny, in sifting the cases of those who had been denounced to you as Christians. They are not to be sought out. If they are denounced and proved guilty, they are to be punished with this reservation, that whoever denies that he is a Christian and really proves it shall be pardoned. But anonymously posted accusations have no place in any prosecution. For this is both a dangerous kind of precedent and out of keeping with the spirit of our age. End quote. Good on you, Trajan. The Emperor urges caution. Just ensure they are loyal to me and to the state. Those complaints that so vexed Pliny in 110 grew dramatically in the decades after Bar Kosiba's revolt, 20 years later. The pagan citizens of the empire couldn't work out the Christians. The Christians behaved like foreign immigrants who had just arrived, although they were nothing of the sort. Their pagan neighbours saw Christians as somehow different, somehow alien. The Romans distinguished between religio and superstitio. Religio was the proper performance of rites to venerate the gods. To the Romans, it was all about performance, not belief. No one cared what you believed, as long as you conducted the right rituals. The Jews relied on their age-old status as an accepted religio, with a unique exemption from the public rituals of state. Prime amongst these was sacrificing to the genius or spirit of the emperor. Christians were granted no such concessions. 
As Pliny shows us, Christianity was always treated as a superstitio, a perverted collection of devotions, rituals and sacrifices. We have one famous example of a small graffito where a pagan mocks the Christians. This was found scratched in plaster on the wall of a room unearthed near the Palatine Hill in Rome in the mid-1800s. The crude image depicts a man bowing down before he is God, a human with a donkey's head crucified on a cross. In the Roman world, crucifixion was a punishment meted out only to traitors, the worst of the worst. Pagans could make no sense of a people who elevated the scum of the earth into a god. By the year 150, a generation after Pliny wrote his letter to Trajan, Christians had acquired an appalling reputation based on little but gossip and rumour. Christians became infamous for three great horrors, Fagitia, Scalera and Malefica, sexual outrages, wickedness and evil deeds. To put it in modern terms, the Romans regarded Christians as witches. Here are comments made by Marcus Cornelius Fronto, one of the most highly respected scholars of his time. Fronto was the Obi-Wan Kenobi to the widely admired philosopher Emperor Marcus Aurelius. Fronto said, Long quote, The Christians hardly have met when they love each other, uniting in the practice of a veritable religion of lusts. Indiscriminately, they call each other brother and sister, thus turning even ordinary fornication into incest. They worship the genitals of their bishop and a priest. A young baby is covered over with flour. It is then served before the person to be admitted into their rites. The recruit is urged to inflict blows onto it. They appear to be harmless because of the covering of flour. It is the blood of this infant, I shudder to mention it, that they lick with thirsty lips. This is the victim by which they seal their covenant. On a special day they gather for a feast with all their children, sisters, mothers, all sexes and all ages. There, flushed with the banquet after such feasting and drinking, they begin to burn with incestuous passions. The lampstand is overturned and extinguished, and with it common knowledge of their actions. In the shameless dark, With unspeakable lust, they copulate in random union, all equally guilty of incest. End quote. Fronto should have known better. Where on earth did he get his gossip from? Most people in the empire, from the emperor down to the humblest sandal maker, thought that Christians were utter burks. In the first two centuries, Christians were not attacked for their belief they were detested as awful human beings. Christians were antisocial, intolerant, depraved pricks. They refused to participate in symbolic civic duties, duties incumbent on every citizen. When others asked them to join the neighbourhood watch, the Christians answered, we look after our own. The Christians were absent from the innumerable religious festivals. Since the Romans did not have a regular work week, these irregular festivals functioned as days off for all. Did you ever see a Christian at the monthly Ides, joining the parade leading a white lamb to the temple of Jupiter for sacrifice? No, you did not. How unpatriotic. Pagans thought that they were hypocrites. The Christians reaped all the benefits of the peace and prosperity bestowed by a forbearing regime. Yet they gave not a whit back to their communities or to the empire. They were malignant parasites. Let's conclude this episode with a look at Christian literature, before the Christians really started churning out books. One curio is the Epistle of the Apostles, a short work recovered in the early 20th century. Perhaps it was composed about the time Fronto was writing. 
the letter is framed as a dialogue between Jesus and his disciples. The epistle is addressed to Christians who are tempted by the emerging Gnostic movement. Against the Gnostics, it argues that Jesus was a real human, who died as any human would, was resurrected and would come again. I'll really dig into the Gnostics in an episode or two. More substantial are the works that ardently promote Christianity and defend the faith against its opponents. We call these documents apologetics. The Jesus clubs had to respond to the condemnations of the Roman state and the physical assaults by the populace. The faithful used the same tactic deployed by earlier Jewish writers such as Philo and Josephus, who sought to commend their religion to the pagans. The very first defence is to be found in the book of Acts. Paul addresses the Athenians. Quote, Acts 17.22 Then Paul said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city, I found among them an altar, with the inscription, to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands. Nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. End quote. The work called The Preaching or Teaching of Peter is the earliest apologetic after Paul. The best we can say is that its author took pen to papyrus in the early 2nd century. The preaching castigates the pagans. Quote, Carried away by ignorance, and not knowing God as we do, but shaping those things over which he gave them power for their use, even wood and stones, brass and iron. They set up things subservient to their existence and worship them. And what things God has given them for food, their own eatables they sacrifice as offerings to eatable gods, and offering dead things to the dead as to gods. They show ingratitude to God, by these practices denying that he exists. End quote. The book also lays into the Jews. Quote, Neither do we worship him as do the Jews, for they, who suppose that they alone know God, do not know him, serving angels and archangels, the month and the moon. And if no moon be seen, they do not celebrate what is called the first Sabbath, nor keep the new moon, nor the days of unleavened bread nor the Feast of Tabernacles, nor the Great Day of Atonement. End quote. The preaching of Peter is not the work of an educated man of the empire. The next apologies we have certainly are. A Greek called Quadratus appealed to the Emperor Hadrian himself about the time of the Bar Kosova revolt in the 130s. The church father Eusebius preserves all we know of Quadratus. Eusebius writes, quote, To the Emperor Tradian, Quadratus addressed a discourse containing an apology for our religion, because certain wicked men had attempted to trouble the Christians. The work is still in the hands of a great many of the brethren. It furnishes clear proofs of the man's understanding and of his apostolic orthodoxy. He reveals the early date at which he lived in the forthcoming words. But the words of our Saviour were always present, for they were genuine. Those that were healed 
and those who were raised from the dead, who were seen not only when they were healed and when they were raised, but were also always present, and not merely while the Saviour was on earth, but also after his death. They were alive for quite a while, so that some of them lived even to our day. End quote. But the real biggie is the apology of Aristides, a contemporary of Quadratus. In the late 19th century, the entire letter was recovered from the famous monastery of St. Catherine's in the Sinai. What a wonderful find. Like Quadratus, Aristides writes to Hadrian. Aristides was an educated Athenian philosopher. He was also a galactically incompetent Christian advocate. Most of his letter is a diatribe against classical paganism. Read the room, Aristides. Read the room. Hadrian was a card-carrying pagan. Hadrian was the supreme pontiff of the Roman state religion. In the last section of his letter, Aristides presents a passionate defence of Christianity. Long quote. But the Christians, O Emperor, have found the truth. For they know and trust in God, the creator of heaven and of earth, to whom there is no other God as companion. They do not commit adultery nor fornication. They honour father and mother, and show kindness to those near to them. They do not worship idols made in the image of man. And their oppressors they appease and make them their friends. They do good to their enemies and their women, O king, are pure as virgins and their daughters are modest. They go their way in all modesty and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them and they love one another and from widows they do not turn away their esteem and they deliver the orphan from him who treats him harshly. And when they see a stranger, They take him into their homes and rejoice over him as a very brother. And if they hear that one of their number is imprisoned, if it is possible to redeem him, they set him free. They observe the precepts of their Messiah with much care, living justly and soberly as the Lord their God commanded them. End quote. Why on earth did Aristides think he would gain Hadrian's favour by assaulting Hadrian's sacred duty as defender of paganism. What next, Aristides? Mailing copies of the Book of Mormon to the Pope. In later years, Christians would proffer more apologies and avoid the blunders of Aristides. In the next show, I explore the weird world of the Gnostics, who threatened the very existence of Orthodox Christianity. Thanks for visiting. For show notes, maps, charts, and timelines, visit my website at www.historyinthebible.com. You can even download professional posters for free.